seven worst German aircraft. Ever since the Lilienthal brothers heard like gliders of the 19th century, Germany has been batshit crazy about flying machines, rocket fighters, suicide pulse jets and airships over three times longer than a 747. Seemingly nothing was too crazy for the German aviation industry to try in the 20th century. Here's a Kladderer Dutch of unheimlich German aircraft that will make you spit out your Spätzle with profound schadenfreude. Number 10. Messerschmitt ME210. Hochgeschwindigkeitsrufmörder. It all started off well enough. As well as possessing aviation's most emphatic forehead, Willy Messerschmitt had delivered the BF-109, which by the outbreak of war was arguably the best single seat fighter in the world. He had followed that up with a BF-110, which was arguably the best twin-engine fighter in the world. Messerschmitt tried for many years to design a replacement for the 109, but any new aircraft he came up with was either inferior to its great rival, the Focke Wolf FW-190, or could offer nothing more than an update model of the 109. And as a result, no new design proceeded past the prototype stage. By contrast, there was no obvious rival in production to the 110, and a replacement would surely be needed. An opinion strengthened by the apparently poor showing of the 110 during the Battle of Britain, though this was arguably down to inadequate understanding of the tactical limitations of this class of aircraft, rather than any particular intrinsic fault of the 110 itself. Thus, the requirement for the 210 was born. Unfortunately for the customer and designer, Messerschmitt's reputation was riding high on the incredible and ongoing success of the 109 and 110, and apparently it could do no wrong. An order for 1000 of the new twin-engine fighter bomber was placed off the drawing board before the new aircraft had even flown. But Fly did, and then the terrible mistake became apparent. The ME210 was purposefully good-looking aircraft, but that was about it. The new aircraft was underpowered and its handling was so bad that it was dangerous to fly, being prone to enter a sudden and vicious stall under the least provocation. The chief test pilot commented that the ME210 had all the least desirable attributes an aeroplane could possess. It took the ridiculous total of 16 prototypes and 94 pre-production models to iron out the worst of the problems that bedeviled the 210. To put this in context, the FW190, a contemporary but very successful aircraft, which also took considerable development to get right, went through 5 prototypes and 28 pre-production examples. And then, even after all this time and effort was expended, the 210 was not an acceptable machine. Compared to the 110, it was replacing the 210 with slower and shorter range, as well as possessing appalling handling qualities. Even the undercarriage was lousy and kept failing on the 210. The 210s that had managed to make it into service nearly three years after the first flight were withdrawn after a month and superseded by the very aircraft they were supposed to replace. The production line was shut down and the BF-110 was put back into production, fitted with the 210's better streamlined engine nacelles. Willy Messerschitt's reputation was in tatters and his resignation was officially demanded from the company that bore his name. Worse was to come. Back when it still looked like the 210 might mature into a decent fighter, permission had been granted to the Dunai Repulingi Pijar Danubian aircraft plant. To build the 210 under license and Hungarian authorities decided to continue development even after production in Germany was halted. The Hungarian aircraft utilized the more powerful DB605 engine and a lengthened fuselage which transformed the aircraft into something generally acceptable. The colossal irony is that the lengthened fuselage was demanded by the test pilot on the ME210's first flight back in September 93. Willy Messerschmitt had refused, pointing out to alter the fuselage would require scrapping millions of Reimark's work of production jigs. The Hungarian aircraft ME210CA was generally popular in service and proved the length of fuselage would have solved literally years of painful development. And of course, that it took the Hungarians to solve the problem that the supposed finest designers of Germany apparently could not overcome was unbearable for the hypernationalistic Third Reich. Eventually, the German redesign of the 210 was yet more powerful. The DB603 engines was accepted into service 
but redesigned the ME410 Hornisse to make it seem like it was completely new design. It wasn't. The ME410 was a decent en enough aircraft, but it was at least two years too late. Had it been available when it should have been, back in 1941, it would have been sensational. Number 9. Messerschmitt ME321, ME323 Gigant. The success of the BF-109 should not obscure the story of the most calamitous aircraft to emerge from the Messerschmitt Aircraft Company. The 321 323. To invade England, the fast movement of tanks and artillery was essential. In the absence of a route by land, air transport was the obvious solution. Messerschmitt initially proposed towing winged battle tanks, a daft concept that proved bizarrely ubiquitous to World War II technical advisors. A less mad idea was the creation of large unpowered gliders. And by large, I mean large. We are talking a wide wingspan of 55 meters, almost that of a Boeing 747. Junkers initially won the German Air Ministry contest with a JU 322, but even a wartime assessment team couldn't turn a blind eye to the fact the tank fell through the weak wooden floor of the 322. They went back to Messerschmitt, who created an aircraft too large to be launched. Even with 3,280 horsepower, the JU-90 airliner struggled to tow this behemoth skybound, so they tried tying it to three, yes, three BF-110 fighters to drag it into the sky in a triangular troika schlepp formation, which of course proved problematic. The next attempt to create an adequately powerful tow aircraft involved bolting two bombers together, resulting in a conjoint HE-11Z swilling, which was also far from ideal. Even strapping rockets to the machine wasn't getting the desired results. While these slapstick endeavors had been taking place, Messerschmitt had been simultaneously working on a powered version, the ME323. This worked, but was so slow and cumbersome that in contested airspace proved abysmally vulnerable. In 43, in desperate need of resupply, General Rommel's Afrika Corp was sent 300 tons of equipment and 16 ME323s. Only two reached their destination. 14 had been shot down. Number 8. Donier DO-31E As with the Royal Air Force in the 1960s, the Luftwaffe became concerned about the vulnerability of aircraft operating from large air bases. The British developed and eventually deployed a Harrier. The Germans, in a frenzy of innovation, developed and flew but did not put into service two potentially supersonic VTOL fast jets and VTOL transport, the DO-31E. They also experimented with zero-length launch system for the Starfighter, the Zell, based on ideas from the rocket genius and occultist sex magician Jack Parsons. The DO-31, as a production aircraft, was envisaged as supplying tactical logistic support to the fast jets. Itself using forward operating bases, the airships on which the Zell Starfighters were expected to land using Arista gear. The tactical and logistic support of forward air operations, it turns out, can be well supported by another aircraft which was in development at the time, the Fiat G222. This has now been developed into today's C27 Sparta, which offers similar payload range performance to the Dornier 31E, albeit with STOL rather than VTOL capacity, at a fraction of the cost, risk, and complexity of a production DO31. The DO31 was an impressive answer to a question that shouldn't have been asked. Technical progress and ambition had run ahead of operational analysis, resulting in flawed recovery. 7. Bade 152. Bard to the bone. That the wretched Bade ever got built says much for the charm of its designer, Bonhof Bade. From 1936, he worked for Junkers and was involved in the design of the U88, U188, U388 and the U287. Following defeat and partitioning, the Soviet Union took many German aerospace experts, including Bade, to aid in the development of new military projects. The Soviets had pressing need for the fast twin-engine jet bomber and the German boffins set about designing one. The resulting EF-150 was conceived by Bade, Hans Wocke and other former Junker staff. 
Hugely delayed by engine problems, the aircraft ended up having to compete and lose out to a greatly superior aircraft from a newer generation, the TU-88, which became the TU-16 Badger. Despite this, Bader may not have been having such a bad time. It is rumored that Bader's winning personality made him a favorite with the Russian masters and that while his colleagues were enduring the biting 1947 Moscow winter, he was enjoying a holiday in Crimea. In 1953, the Germans were sent back to East Germany, where some attempted to start an aviation industry for the new nation. A new jetliner was desired, and Bader initiated the project, dubbed the Type 152. Based on the EF-150, this was a terrible basic design for a jetliner. For a start, it had a bicycle undercarriage, meaning the aircraft could not rotate promptly on takeoff and it required great precision to land precisely, something they attempted to rectify with a later, somewhat bizarre configuration. It also had terrible build engines. Piernan O14s, based on wartime technology, which offered a miserably 3 to 1 thrust to weight ratio. Compare this to the 4.5 to 1 of the Pratt & Whitney GT3D, which first ran a year earlier than the Perna, and a lousy specific fuel consumption. The wings were the wrong shape and in the wrong place. A low aspect ratio brought cord slap that was far from ideal for cruising efficiency. The high placing of the wings obstructed the cabin while the space under the floor was occupied by the undercarriage. The maiden flight of this aircraft took place on 4th December 1958. Four months later, the aircraft took its second flight and crashed, killing all on board. In mid-1961, the East German government stopped all aeronautical industry activities, as the Soviet Union did not want to buy any of these aircraft or support a potential rival to their own TU-124. This mercifully put an end to what would have certainly been a horrible airliner. Number 6. Heinkel HE-177. Good grief. The eternally repeated adage, if it looks right, it will fly right, is proved by the giant Heinkel HE-177 four-engine bomber. Even before entering service, it attracted the epitaph of Widowmaker and Flying Coughing. Goering called it a misbegotten monster. Conceived as a long-range bomber to attack targets beyond the Soviet Urals or operate against convoys in the North Atlantic, it was too late to make a difference. It is the only example of a German design equivalent of the American YB-17 design and the British plans including R.J. Mitchell's B-16 or 36 for long-range strategic warfare. The Heinkel design was immediately beset by compromises, engine issues and top-level mind changing. Even in its development, Oberst Ernst Udet caused a fundamental redesign by requiring a dive bombing capability. The engineers were in despair. The dive bombing profile would require fuselage and wing strengthening, increasing the empty weight significantly. Then in September 42, after the work had been done, Goering rescinded the requirement. So it had a flawed operational requirement, inadequate power plant with four engines driving two huge propellers and surface evaporative cooling in place of conventional radiator. Engine fires were frequent during trials and by the time it came into service, there was no fuel. Even so, there was a plan to convert it into a rocket-carrying fighter. Final words to Winkle Brown. It was one of the very few German aircraft I did not enjoy flying. 5. Siemens Schuckert Forsmann Großer, nutzloser Ladenhüter. Virtually all First World War aircraft were, by modern standards, hopeless and awful. However, Siemens Schuckert's first foray into the world of large bomber aircraft was a standout example of dreadful uselessness, an aircraft so awful that it eventually collapsed in an act of overdue self-destructive embarrassment. The Forsman's problem began before even the first wood was cut, canvas sewn, all the workers got out of bed in the eponymous form of Villard Forsman, the luckless aircraft Swedish designer. German aviation benefited immensely from at least one aircraft designer from a neutral nation in the form of Dutchman Anthony Fokker, a notoriously self-publicized but in undeniably an engineer of talent. Sadly, Forsman was no Fokker, and his engineering abilities would not prove equal to his Jules Verne-esque dreams of giant aircraft. 
It would appear that Forsman's aircraft was inspired, less sympathetic voices might say, a copy of Igor Zikovsky's impressive Ilya Modomets, the world's first four-engine aircraft. A famous photograph depicts one of these aircraft in flight and the first thing one notices is the two stalwart Russian cavalry officers promenading on the roof of the aircraft as if taking a stroll on an aircraft during flight were the most normal thing in the world. One of the other things one may notice is that the pilot is shoving in a downward elevator as though his life depended on it, as indeed it might. In other words, it appears to be tail heavy. When Forsman designed his own aircraft for German cavalry officers to stroll on the roof of, he apparently decided being insanely tail heavy was also definitely the way to go, a situation that would prove almost fatal to the test pilot once the aircraft actually managed to fly. However, any proper idea of flight was a long way off, yet as during taxi trials and minimal hops, many of the faults of Forsman's creation became apparent. The structure was deemed to be too weak and was beefed up, not least by adding more wing struts, the first of an unprecedented five major and ultimately futile rebuilds and redesigns. There was insufficient tail area, so a second radar was added and the wings were rigged with slight dihedral. At the same time, an attempt to balance the tail heaviness issue was made by crudely adding a tub-like gunner's position on the nose. Further short hops revealed that the modification had not made the aircraft anywhere near acceptable. Any reasonable manufacturer would have cut their losses, dumped their hopeless aircraft and moved on, but Siemens Schuckert were determined that they should give, get some kind of return for their investment and besides, Willard Forsman had by now severed connections with the company, so they reasoned a different better engineer should be able to rework the aircraft into something acceptable. Harald Wolf, who would later design Siemens Schuckert's excellent fighter aircraft, was the man chosen for this unenviable task. Wolf added more powerful Mercedes engines in the inboard positions, leaving the outer engines as they were. All the engines received streamlined and strengthened mountings and the whole nose of the aircraft was reworked into a pointed shape with massive round windows. The pilot now sat in comfort under a fully enclosed cockpit, an incongruously advanced feature. Unfortunately, the designated test pilot, after some ground runs and despite his comfortable enclosed cockpit, refused wisely to fly the aircraft. Siemens Schuckert managed to persuade AAs and pre-war test pilot Walter Hohendorf to perform the first flight, but in September of 1915, whilst completing another test top, something went array. The aircraft turned onto its back and was partially wrecked. Siemens Schuckert, who were nothing if not persistent, mended the wings of the aircraft and fitted another new nose. Now desperate to get something, anything for the hopeless machine, Dr. Reichel, the technical director of Siemens Schuckert, persuaded the army to lower the specification the aircraft was required to achieve before they would buy it in return for a reduction in the purchase price. The new specification required the aircraft to reach 2000 meters in 30 minutes, carrying a useful load of 1000 kilos and enough fuel for 4 hours. Meanwhile, he offered Bruno Steffen, himself a successful aircraft designer, 10% of the sale price if he could make the acceptable flight which was scheduled for October. Despite warnings from France regarding the structural safety of the aircraft, Bruno decided, after inspecting factory drawings and the aircraft itself, that it was strong enough. However, he was concerned that he would lack the strength necessary to operate the massive tail surfaces. On the day of the flight, Steffen invited five passengers to accompany him, including members of the army, acceptance commission, but all politely declined. On takeoff, Stefan found that Forsman's tail heaviness meant that he had to push the control column fully forward to maintain level flight. To make turns, he had to pull it back to the neutral position, turn the wheel as quickly as he could and immediately turn it to the fully forward position to avoid a stall. The aircraft was virtually uncontrollable. Nonetheless, it achieved the required 2,000 meters in 30 minutes and the army agreed in April 1916 to buy it as a trainer, despite its total unsuitability for that or any other task. Luckily for everyone, however, the rear fuselage collapsed when the engines were run up on the ground and no one else had to risk life and limp in Forsman's pathetic aircraft. And that would have been that, except for one strange coda. In 1918, a truly gigantic 10-engine triplane named Pol, after the town of its construction, was designed. It was structurally weak, 
of unprecedented size and ludicrously tail-heavy, which sounds oddly familiar. It was intended to bomb New York, but construction was halted due to the armistice. Its designer was Willard Forsman, and one wonders how he managed to persuade anyone to build this new ridiculous aircraft. A single giant wheel from the pole survived to this day in the collection of the Imperial War Museum to remind the world of Forsman's folly. Number 4. Messerschmitt ME-163 Comet Wie ein Floh, aber oho. Although it was a horrific death trap with a litany of flaws, no one could deny the Comet was amazingly impressive. The fastest aircraft of the Second World War. Messerschmitt's rocket plane also possessed the best climb rate of any aircraft in the world until the supersonic and strict research Bell X-1. Its vertical performance could not be bettered by any combat aircraft until the mid-50s. In every other respect, of course, the Comet was totally appalling. The first problem, and worst when looked at it from a tactical point of view, was its endurance. The Walter HWK 509 rocket motor that imparted the Comet with its blistering performance was colossally thirsty and only 8 minutes of fuel could be carried. The engine was either on or off. There was no ability to cruise or throttle back, which led in extolery to its second major flaw. The closing speed between it and its target was so great that it was extremely difficult to aim and fire with any hope of success. This problem was compounded by the powerful MK-1089 cannon. The low muzzle velocity of this weapon meant it was only effective at close range and this was difficult to achieve as the ME-163 flashed past its intended target. Thirdly, once the rocket fuel was expended, the aircraft had to glide home. Totally immune from fighter attack while under power, the Comet was vulnerable as a glider. True, it was fast and handled nicely, but eventually it would have to land, and unable to move, could be destroyed at will by any pursuing aircraft. Its woeful endurance led to the Comet employing the weight-saving future of jettisoning undercarriage. The wheels were attached to a dolly that was dropped as the aircraft climbed away from the airfield. If dropped too high, they would be destroyed. However, if dropped too low, there was a danger that they would bounce off the ground and into the aircraft, with disastrous results. On occasion, the wheels got stuck. Test pilot Hanna Reich was nearly killed attempting to land a Comet with its wheels still attached. Even if the takeoff was successful, landing the Comet was fraught with danger. Landings were underpowered, so there was no option to go round if something went wrong, and the aircraft landed on a retractable sprung kit, which had to be lowered to provide shock absorbing. If it stuck up or the pilot forgot to lower it, the result was often a fractured spine. But absolutely the worst aspect for the pilot was the fuel. The Comet was propelled by two toxic liquids called Seestoff and Tiestoff that exploded when brought into contact. Indeed, T-stuff would cause virtually any organic material such as leather or cloth to spontaneously combust. Furthermore, it would dissolve human flesh. When the luckless Yoshi Pöss crashed an early comet on landing in 1943, he was covered in T-stuff and despite wearing a protective suit, his entire right arm had been dissolved by T-stuff. It simply wasn't there. The other arm, as well as the head, was nothing more than a mass of soft jelly. Regular aviation fuel is dangerous enough, but this was nightmarish. Even if the landing were successful, the shock of landing could rupture a fuel line or slosh any residual propellants into contact with each other and a catastrophic explosion would be the near inevitable result. So volatile were the fuels that there are accounts of comets spontaneously exploding for no apparent reason while simply sitting on the ground. But if the pilot survived the takeoff, the landing, the fuels, and prowling enemy fighters, the Comet had one final trick up its sleeve. Despite having generally exemplary handling characteristics, the ME-163 entered an unrecoverable condition known as the Graveyard Dive. If its speed exceeded Mach 0.84, which was not difficult in a Comet, and the results were invariably fatal. Despite all these horrific issues, combat operations were maintained from May 44 to Spring 45, during this time, there were 9 confirmed kills, with 14 ME-163s lost. Feldwebel Siegfried Schubert was the most successful pilot, with 3 bombers to its credit, but he was killed when his comet exploded on takeoff. 
Despite or perhaps because of its obvious catastrophic flaws, the Comet remains one of the most charismatic aircraft in history. Three, DFW T.28 Flo, Lucia Kleiner, Knolliger Kerl. Back in 1915, people still didn't know what aeroplanes were supposed to look like. At least that's the only explanation I can think of to explain the delightfully chunky appearance of the DFW's T.28, cheerily named Flo, or Flea, the cuddliest combat aircraft ever built. There seems to be no other reason for building this tiny yet simultaneously weirdly massive machine. Despite being reputedly very fast, because of its staffed shape, the floor was never a serious contender for fighter operations. The main problem was visibility, which was excellent so long as you only wanted to look upwards. The pilot's view forward for takeoff and landing was non-existent, and the massive triangular tail surfaces conspired with the biplane wings to obscure the view of more or less anything below the aircraft. With all this fuselage side area and only a relatively modest rudder, one can only assume that directional control was not the aircraft's strong suit. Add to that a perversely narrow undercarriage and it should come as no surprise that the floor crashed on landing after its first test flight. On the upside, the arrangement of intake on the aircraft's nose gives the appearance of a jolly smiling face always a major boon for an aircraft intended for the deadly skies over the Western Front. Just proof that he wasn't insane or obsessed with giving aircraft a ruinesque profile, Hermann Dorna, who designed the floor, went on to produce the outstanding Hannover CL series of two seat fighters which were boringly slender by comparison, did not feature a jolly smiling face and proved highly successful. 2. Zeppelin L2 Wasserstoff-Brennstoff-Feueranzünder Zeppelins are preposterous. That such a ludicrous vehicle in can could inspire such panic from people on the ground, which it did, seems, with the benefit of hindsight, insane. Of course, no one had experienced a sustained strategic bombing campaign back then and facing such attacks for the first time was a scary prospect. The sheer massiveness of the rigid airship is also co certainly compelling. Back in the first couple of years of the First World War, they were the only aerial vehicle with a useful disposable load at the range necessary to mount meaningful bombing attacks deep behind enemy lines. But the fact is that the Zeppelins of World War I consisted of fabric bags filled with between about 1 and 2 million cubic feet of hydrogen, the most flammable element in the universe. Zeppelins are huge and inflammable, present an unmissably massive target are slow and susceptible to bad weather. Bizarrely, despite having more than enough carrying capacity to reasonably carry them, German airship crews chose not to bother taking parachutes on missions. Presumably, being able to escape having to choose between plummeting to one's death or being incinerated in a hydrogen-fueled inferno was just too namby-pamby for the stalwart Zeppelin man of the Imperial German Navy. And that was a choice that became increasingly commonplace after the first Zeppelin was shot down over Belgium in June 1915. That the Navy persisted in using these giant airships for bombing raids was largely down to the insistence of one dangerously psychopathic zealot, Captain Suze Peter Strasser. Despite ever increasing evidence of the ever decreasing effectiveness of the Zeppelin as a bombing aircraft, Strasser continued to demand his crews fly strategic raids over London with ever greater losses. We who strike the enemy by his heartbeats have been slandered as baby killers. Nowadays there is no such animal as a non-combatant. Modern warfare is total warfare, he said in answer to criticism of the morality of strategic bombing. This may have been true, but doesn't exactly paint a glowing picture of Strasser's character. It feels like there was a certain poetic justice at work when after this particular baby killer had chosen to ride along Zeppelin L-70 on what would be the last airship bombing raid attempted against Britain, Strasser's Zeppelin was intercepted by a DH-4 pilot by Egbert Cadbury of the noted chocolate-making family and shot down in an example of the aforementioned hydrogen-fueled inferno. The crew did not have parachutes. But all this was in the future in 1913, when Navy Zeppelin L2 chucked its way over Berlin and into the somewhat obscure history books. 
That the Zeppelin was a bizarrely horrific weapon of war for all concerned is not in doubt, but the L2 was probably the most hopeless of them all. Not content with being an impractical and dangerous vehicle when under attack by a determined enemy, L2 showed the world that Zeppelins were dangerous and impractical when there were literally no threats present at all, unless you consider a warm day of the aircraft itself a threat. First, the engines wouldn't start, which caused a delay in takeoff, which allowed the hydrogen to expand in the gas bags due to the warm sun. Once the engines were persuaded into life, the Zeppelin shot into the sky due to hydrogen expansion. The normal cure for this is to release some of the gas and stop the aircraft rising. Unfortunately, the hydrogen vented from L2's gas bags was sucked into the forward engine and exploded, which caused a fire and further explosion resulting in the destruction of the L2 along with the death of all 28 people on board in a hydrogen-fueled inferno. That this occurred only six weeks after the Navy's other Zeppelin, the L1, had been caused to crash with 14 fatalities by cold rain causing the gas to contract makes one wonder why the German Navy persisted in the development of large airships at all. Zeppelin eventually delivered over 100 large rigid airships during the First World War, with Schutt Lanz delivering about 20 more. Number 1 Fiesler F1 103A Reichenberg Doodlefuck Life Imagine yourself as a plucky young Luftwaffe pilot in 1944. You have a talent for flying and the Nazi propaganda machine has filled you with mad zeal for to fight. You leap at the chance to fly an experimental aircraft. A futuristic airplane that could turn the tide and save your nation. You are shown a sleek, sexy, jet-propelled Wunderwaffe that makes the latest FW190 look positively ancient. Or perhaps you are a bewildered child pushed into the moribund hell that was not of your making. Either way, you are absolutely fucked because your new steed is essentially a V1 flying bomb with human guidance systems. Say guten Morgen to the Fiesler F1 103R Reichenberg. The Reichenberg had a quick development period, probably too quick. The German Research Institute for Sailplane Flight started development in mid-44 and had the prototype ready for testing within days. A cramped cockpit with a jettisonable canopy was placed just under the Pulse jet air intake. And flight controls were rudimentary, although straightforward. After a release from a carrier aircraft, the Reichenberg was meant to be piloted towards a target and put into a dive following which the pilot bailed out. Pilot survival was optimistically rated as being most unlikely. It was estimated at a terrifying 1% due to the proximity of the pulse jet's intake to the cockpit. Tricky landing controls ensured that two test articles crashed during the development trials and although the designers claimed a distinction between their Selbstopfer manner and the Japanese kamikaze to the pilot, there was little difference. Thankfully for the young man, expected to fly the screaming tomb, it was quickly abandoned after Albert Speer and Werner Baumbach pleaded with Hitler that suicide was not in German warrior tradition. <laughs>